you clicked on the video, you know what I'm ranting about this week. You guys have encouraged these rants, so I'm going to continue with them. Games as a service. A term we've heard a lot in the past two or three years, and really recently hardcore driven into us. But what are they really? How do they function, and why do they seem like a plague right now? Are they innately bad for the gaming industry, or has their implementation just been done purely to exploit you, and there's actually good ways of implementing them? These are questions that come up, and the ones I need to answer right now. We're going to talk about them, but first I have to tell you two things. One, we are playing Fallout Equestria tonight at 9pm with Moonhoof and all of our friends. Show up early for the pre-show hangout, and please bring your popcorn. There's going to be combat. Two, my book, Fallout Equestria Dead Tree, has pre-orders ending this weekend. This is your last chance to get it before we move to the Traveling Pony Museum pricing and your last chance to get the free bonus print. Now, on to the show. Games as a service are a concept that you purchase a game in what is effectively an early beta state or with a bunch of content not yet built. There is no real plan to build an end to the game. They are designed around looting, improving your character, rinse and repeat. They are made to release new content in a trickle effect while continuing to fix bugs to keep you interested and keep bringing you back to the game in hopes of making you spend more time and therefore probably more money on that game. Examples of this recently are Anthem, Fallout 76, Destiny, Warframe, just to name a few. The problem with this concept is it's like buying a car while it's still being designed by the engineer. Effectively, if we're entirely honest, games as a service are being shoved out under the ideas of a Kickstarter or Indiegogo funded AAA game. Now I know what you're saying is that some of you are going to say that MMOs fall under the same category as well. And to some degree they do. We also have MMOs to blame for this as they're an early version of this. But when an MMO releases, it also has a finished game. And at the end of the game, you have an end game, like a raid or something, as well as a definite end to the current story. Games as a service lack this. You just keep playing after the end game. Now, let me say this. I'm not saying this is innately a bad system. But recently it's been abused so much that the term games as a service or live service has just made us all scream for a bunch of reasons that this is terrible and awful. Recent good examples of live services are things like Elite Dangerous and Warframe. Upon release of version 1.0, they were finished games. Elite Dangerous is a full $60, price, $60 game while Warframe is free to play. They expect you to keep putting money into them post-launch for cosmetics and large expansions of content access, paywalls, for DLCs. But now I have to talk about the bad. Anthem, Battlefield 5, Fallout 76. There's a lot of things that fall into this category. And even, dare I say it, World of Warcraft in the last couple years are designed to have you buy a full price game, pay for DLCs, spend loads on co cosmetics to keep funding them, and they are designed for people to be addicted to and play them over and over again. They are made so that you play their game, and only their game, constantly, in hopes of sucking your entire entertainment budget every month from your wallet. This is purely predatory. They were both designed by studios and with franchises that have no business making a live service. Think about it. If you played any three of these games, what is the end game? Does the story end at the end game or does it just t tell you to do it again? The end game is multiplayer with friends where you get skins, costumes, loot, and items constantly evolving over a cycle of loot, trade, build, equip, fight, loot, over and over again. That's your game cycle. Loot, build, fight, loot. 
Your quest in Anthem and Fallout 76 have no effect on the world itself. It doesn't matter how many super mutants you mow down. It doesn't matter how if you're allied to the Enclave and I'm allied to the Brotherhood of Steel. We can still just jump in a party together and go running around. They don't change or evolve the story around you at all. You have no impact on the game at all. You can repeat most of them on top of that. And they don't tell good stories. Both games released in completely broken states to shore up shareholder numbers and because they had to have a hard release date for this quarter in hopes of all of us buying into the idea that the game is going to be better later. I didn't pay $60 for early access. Sorry. Moreover, they're both designed so that our single story, beginning to end, single player experience is gone, and instead, the story doesn't actually end. It just tells you to go back and come back tomorrow and do more things. Now, let me step back a moment and give you an example of where this all evolved from, and, and please understand that I'm bashing the concept, not necessarily the games, though I do think that these are terrible games. Live services evolved from the free-to-play MMO model into what we see today. Games like these, Fortnite, PUBG, Star Trek Online, MechWarrior Online, and many others, wouldn't be possible without early free-to-play models. This means STO, who implemented a very successful loot box predatory model to pay to upgrade all your stuff to make you drop hundreds of dollars into their game. They're funded by relatively small populations, too. The average player base on STO post the month of a new expansion release is like 1,200. Games like MechWarrior Online are also to blame for this, but recently Piranha has gone back on that model as well as announced MechWarrior 5 as a single player experience. Seems like if you give enough pushback and hammer into companies that we will tank their bottom line, they'll actually listen. Which is how we get to where we are now. People enabled companies like Activision through Warcraft's new cash shop and EA through FIFA, Madden, and Battlefield, as well as Destiny 1 and 2 to just abuse you over and over again. The height of this abuse was the Star Wars Battlefield game that came out and it was so blatantly awful and so blatantly pay to win that they actually are being investigated for loot box gambling now. I get that Destiny 2 is an exception here in that it has improved drastically. But there are still the parts of Destiny 2 with lines that act like no one knows you or what you are. It's clearly cut content from the first game with dates for that content being during the first game's development cycle that were cut out and are now just being added back in. The voice actors didn't even record new lines. The writers didn't even write new parts. These parts were obviously finished and yet it's released to us like brand new stuff for the live service for us to come in and play. That's the other thing about these live services. They deliberately cut content from the game to release it in an earlier state and then release this content that they've cut later to say, we're making progress to be better, to get better and here's your new content. Come back and play. Each release hoping to bring back a wave of players in the hopes of extracting more money with less effort. Let's look at this EA business chart from an investor meeting, no less, in 2017. This is what EA officially brought to an investor meeting to convince investors to throw more money into their stock so that they could make more so that they can make games. You can see they want to move to live services, games as a service. For a start, it doesn't require lots of new development, just injections of more content regularly into the same aging game to keep reoccurring revenue, which means that what would normally be a six or seven year development cycle for massive AAA awesome games is now reduced to a couple months to release new content for games that are aging. They report higher user engagement because in a single player game, you finish the game, unless there's an expansion or DLC, you're done. You've had your experience, you've paid your money, you're gone. The live service keeps giving money because it's a grinding effort to keep players invested in the game to get the next high that's always further away. If anything, it treats players like drug addicts. 
In the past, as well, you had to focus on one platform, PC or consoles. Now you can put it on all of them, no questions asked, and use your own storefronts to bombard people with buy this and get that, while at the same time using spyware. Origin and MyCom Launcher are great at doing this. They get user information in order to turn around and hit you with targeted ads at targeted spending prices. Who remembers the, that company talking about taking, making players into payers? Turning players into payers. It's no longer developer reliant on game content. Players make their own content with the tools you give them. Meaning it costs no money to keep making content for a game so long as you keep up an appropriate level of grind. In other words, we don't have to make it fun because anything can be fun with friends. It becomes less about the individual gameplay experience and more about our platform experience with reoccurring fees to access your game. Don't believe me? Wargaming now has in their user and license agreement that you have to agree to to play their game, that they own the game and everything on your account. They can take it away at any time and put a fee to access it if they wish. Literally, in their EULA now, you don't even own your account or the stuff on your account. It's in every EA game now too. You don't own, you don't own your game, you're renting it from them. Lastly, it boils down to units sold versus we don't even have to sell a disc anymore because we can go pure digital even on collector's editions. The game has value so long as you keep running the servers. As soon as it doesn't make money anymore, we move the devs to other projects that we want to keep, we fire the ones we don't need anymore, and we cut all the players off from game services. Remember Spore? Know how every time you log into Spore now, it asks you for all this stuff that says that Spore doesn't have a server anymore and you can't access all this, all these wonderful features about Spore without getting onto the server? Yeah, it's gone. Part of the gameplay experience on Spore was sharing your creations. You can't do that anymore because the server's off. And all those creations, they're gone too. They're deleted. If you didn't save them on your computer, they're gone. Furthermore, we can now move the servers to a new live service without having to buy new equipment, further cutting our costs, and meaning we can use the same infrastructure over and over again in infinitum. From a strictly business standpoint, this makes sense. It means it costs a lot less, we can make a lot more money faster, and we can have a more predictable revenue and growth of income to make our stock prices more valuable and therefore make the people at the top make more money. Furthermore, we can cut our costs on development and production through the floor because we don't need as many developers once the game comes out. We just start cutting jobs wherever we don't need them anymore and put more and more pressure on single individuals to, to do the work of what would normally be an entire studio while the players play with their friends and keeps them engaged. I hate that term. I really do. Like I'm trying to find another term to use for people coming back to, to watch my live streams other than engagement, but it kind of seems like the, the AAA gaming industry has salted that term to the point I don't even want to use it anymore. From a user standpoint though, this is downright criminally anti-consumer. You don't own your any games anymore, the store does. If you get banned from the storefront for something, you lost all your games too. If EA or Bethesda tomorrow decide you have to pay a fee now to access their storefront, many people's entire Bethesda libraries or origin libraries would be gone without paying that monthly fee. More importantly, unlike Steam or Epic Games, all that money goes straight to the publisher, not to the developer. Whereas Steam or Epic sends it to whoever is listed on the company to have it sent to, EA doesn't have to tell developers the sales numbers or give them bonuses. They can just keep all the money and keep funding it into their own pockets, allowing them to pay developers less and less to keep their cycles going. Recently, EA and BioWare, like this is in the last couple days, have caused thousands if not millions of dollars in damage by bricking PlayStation 4s and Xbox Ones with buggy Anthem code. 
This is so bad it got on BBC Primetime. However, because their end user license agreement protects them, they don't have to pay for it or refund any money because you agreed they wouldn't have to. Instead, Sony is paying for refunds that have, without even asking any questions, but you still have a $450 paperweight now as your PS4 console is completely destroyed internally. The problem with these live services also includes grind as content. Developer Frontier really started this off with Elite Dangerous, where hours of grind to get one ship unlocked from the Federation was required. EA and Bethesda have made experiences with Anthem and Fallout 76 so grindy I actually refunded Anthem only 30 minutes into playing because I estimated it would take me over 10 hours to complete a single quest. The game was designed innately to exceed my time for the refund and ensure I was going to have to play the same segment over and over again. Because of this, I haven't even bothered with a review because I can't afford to. All I can tell you is I wouldn't get it if I were you. You can't deny Fallout 76 is just as grindy. With guns having levels now, just as they did in Borderlands, a single player game, the same combat shotgun that you've heavily modified it and spent a ton of caps on won't be much use four or five levels later. You'll have to search for a new one and use whatever, or use whatever loot has been dropped and do the same requests of extermination, exploration, or find X holotape. Is the grind enjoyable? To some people, to me, it seems pointless because I expected to play an RPG where my actions had consequences that led somewhere. I don't expect to grind like this in what are supposed to be story-driven, supported, quest-based RPGs. I also expect to be able to earn items in-game in a reasonable amount of time. In MechWarrior Online, after about a month, I've bought five or six new mechs, and I've earned enough mech currency to get several hero mechs. With Anthem, it is estimated you'll have to play 12 hours to get perfect 12 hours to get your first early game skin. In late game, it's estimated 50 hours plus to get one skin. Angry Joe cited in his review that he played the game for over 40 hours and still couldn't buy a single skin with the in-game currency. The publishers and developers are the ones who set this economic system. Fallout 76, I haven't played enough to get a for sure number, but it's generally agreed around level 20, you stop getting enough Atom to really pay for anything in the Atom shop. Except for daily quests, which you have to do every single day, and it takes weeks to rack up enough for one single costume. Why does this sound like World of Warcraft? Oh wait, we've seen this song and dance before. Activision Blizzard have heavily implemented it, implemented it with great success back in large-scale MMO days, and here we have our little action-packed looter shooters like Destiny doing the same thing. When was the last time we had a good looter shooter? Borderlands. You guys realize Borderlands is not like a recent game, right? Borderlands 2 came out, you're ready for this one, in 2012, seven years ago. Borderlands did it right except for level scaling between people when you played together. You basically had to be like the same level. But you had a definite beginning and end point. You had a reason to log back in and do user-created content with friends. You could just play alone and have fun to experience the story, or you could play to max level with stupidly insane level weapons that had obscene effects. It was all up to you. My point here stands thus. The live service model right now is a plague. Even MechWarrior Online is testing my nerves with a trickle feed of MechWarrior 5 while releasing new mechs such as the Marauder 2 and Rifleman 2C. I refuse to support games like Star Trek Online at all because of how stuff is shanghai behind paywalls and hundreds of ships are now locked away in special loot boxes that are only available for a limited time. I refuse to even give Anthem 
the time to do a review. Don't get me started on pay to win buffs for limited time outfits in Fallout 76. You all know what I'm talking about, those unstoppable outfits for the month of February. You can expect more shit like that in Fallout 76, and you can expect it to be limited time, pay to win buffs. The fact that these companies will keep doing these practices so long as we keep supporting it. It's like a coke habit. They need the next drug so they will take them higher to get more money. At first it was the death of single player, now it's games as a service or live services. Whatever comes next, we need to hardcore not buy into it. At least not until we see less millionaires at the top telling creatives who are, in some cases, completely disposable at the bottom to do as they're told instead of making actually good games. I have no hope for Dragon Age 4 because of the leak that development was relatively reset when EA demanded that Dragon Age 4 have more live service elements in it. This has been Fiora, and I hope you enjoyed this week's ranting. Until next time, I'll see you tonight at 9 o'clock Eastern Standard Time for Fallout Equestria. And hopefully, if you want to read the Fallout Equestria book, you'll pick up a copy. Or you can access it freely, because remember, I don't put anything behind paywalls. That's also why you don't have ads on this video. Good night, everyone. So you stuck around to the end. I see you. Uh huh. Yep, you're still here. If you're still here, um, comment below with suggestions for the next Fallout Equestria contest we should hold. Let me know. That'll tell me you stayed to the end. In the meantime, see you guys next time.